I've been trying to fix the schools for some years, and this is the closest I've ever gotten to watching some real changes take place. There's a danger of, in the next few years, these tools are going to become so powerful with images and sounds and TV and music and the interactive level. It's going to be so high. You'll be able to interact with these machines at such an engaging, involved level that we will be automating our classrooms. What could be worse than being in a station wagon with three kids who are uh, 11, 13, and 15 who keep saying, aren't we there yet? Because they're bored. Well, that's what school's like. Craig Newman is right. Very often schools are boring places for teachers and students. It's hard to learn and it's hard to teach when you're bored. I'm John Merrow. In this edition of Learning Matters, how and why to make schools interesting places. I think you'll be interested. You heard Frank Newman say that schools need to be made more interesting. Well, okay, but the next question is how? For some, the answer is technology. And that doesn't just mean computers in the classroom, but instead a whole array of machines, CD players, camcorders, VCRs, all joined to a computer with students working cooperatively to produce their own video products. This new wrinkle is known as multimedia, and it allows students and teachers to escape electronically from the information poor classroom and explore the world. This man, Fred Dignazio in East Lansing, Michigan, is a kind of Johnny Appleseed of multimedia, which he says works especially well with students who are turned off by school. What about all those kids, at-risk children? They're the ones, especially kids who are having trouble with print and reading too. To bring them into math and algebra, this stuff just doesn't seem to have any meaning to them. They have no connection to school. I see multimedia as a wonderful incentive to engage these kids in learning and to lead them to the world of language, lead them to the world of arithmetic and communication skills and culture and civilization because it's on their wavelength. These kids, no matter rich or poor, are electronic. They are TV babies and they look at images and moving images and they hear electronic sounds. They have a rhythm that's different from us adults and I think that's where you've got to start a teacher that can teach along their wavelength and then gradually lead them respectfully as learners into these other worlds of learning that teachers want to take the kids, they are the ones that are going to be um, successful and doing the most, I think, good in society because these are the kids who are going to be our workforce of the 21st century. Our workforce is changing. and We have a huge and growing at-risk population. Multimedia is the key to getting them back into the classroom. You really are a Johnny Appleseed, aren't you? Yeah, I just believe it. I, but you caught me on the thing that I believe in, which is for people who are the have-nots. I always hear, oh, my gifted and talented kids. This is perfect for, for my gifted kids. And I always say, yeah, that's great for gifted kids. They're going to do these incredible things. But what about a kid who's emotionally conflicted or learning disabled or visually impaired? Um, are kids who are troublemakers in your class who are back in the room being a discipline problem? They're the kids that this is just what they need. They can become your facilitators, your multimedia SWAT team. Those kids are great with this equipment. They make it work when no other kid in the class can make it work. Are they, they're great visually and graphically and they do neat images. Or maybe they're the ham, the real big kid who's a ham. He's a troublemaker, but that's the kid you want to put on camera and be the announcer because they really jazz it up and it's kind of like Hollywood. And everybody loves it. And all of a sudden the kid looks at themselves and says, my God, you know, I'm, I'm a valuable person here. Everybody's saying neat things about me instead of saying, you know, what a jerk off or a screw up or, you know, and all of a sudden the kid's self-esteem just goes up. We, we've had so many children that their teachers said they were problem children in their classroom and they started working with the kids as their multimedia helpers and the kids did a complete turnaround. With a grant from the state of Michigan and support from several high-tech companies, Fred Dignazio established the Teacher Explorer Center, where he conducts workshops for teachers and administrators from all over the state. So many teachers are right on the edge of burnout, and they have such a hard job to do. I believe that, among te especially our best teachers. They're straining to the limit. And I think what multimedia does is it's a self-renewing process, is it teaches teachers to work together more like colleagues and cooperative learners and rely on each other and so it gives you a support structure that way and then it's just completely renewed the children teachers who forgot why they entered the profession and they taught the same subject veteran teachers for 20 years and all of a sudden we say 
but you could be teaching that doing this, and I'm going to show you today. And all of a sudden, it, it gives it a whole new look, it, that old thing they've been teaching. Or they couldn't reach these kids. The, every day they go into the classroom, and just all these kids are either failing or about to drop out, and they have all these problems at home. And all of a sudden, they're having successes with these children. Every day, they come back to me and say, I did something today I never did before, or I reached a child I could never reach before. And so it's like the greatest, I think, weapon against teacher burnout. Multimedia can be expensive, but Dignazio says it doesn't have to be. Buy everything new and you could spend $7,000. But a single workstation could be assembled with old equipment. Total cost, zero. Dignazio warns that multimedia technology could do great harm in the classroom. The electronic media all around us are very powerful, and they're most powerful with young people. They are attention grabbers for kids. So what I'm worried about is that we will, without having these strategies of cooperative learning, kids taking responsibility for their learning, having the classroom be a student-centered room, a people, human being-centered room, if we don't have that as our core value or strategy, then I think there's a danger of, in the next few years, these tools are going to become so powerful with images and sounds and TV and music and the interactive level. It's going to be so high. You'll be able to interact with these machines at such an engaging, involved level that we will be automating our classrooms. And we have the danger of automating the teacher right out of the classroom. The human teacher has the danger right now of be basically being de-skilled from being the classroom leader to being a, a technical uh, facilitator or technician on the edge of the classroom. And the primary learning that goes on, the primary a interaction, is between the students and the machines. So we're, this is a crossroads, you're saying? Yes, I, I think that uh, right now that a lot of schools need to, in their technology plans, need to give a lot of thought and really visualize what kind of classroom of the future they want to build. And you're saying keep people at the center, not the machine at the center. I think it comes down to gut level human values. Are we in-skilling human beings? Are we empowering them? Are we uplifting them? Are we making them more human and more able to realize their goals and helping them help others do that? Or are we dampening them? Are we lowering them? Are we de-skilling them? What is our objective here? And I think there is the danger that we could misuse our machines and de-skill our teachers and turn our children essentially into electronic plugs into these learning sockets. And the kids each day will willingly, they would be like Nintendo games, learning games like Nintendo. Each kid would rush into the room and willingly plug themselves into the machine for the whole day of learning and then not emerge until lunchtime or for a restroom break or something like that. And uh, that's the way it's going. The technology is that powerful. That's scary. That is scary. But to many people, that's the best way to learn, is to get rid of the teachers, make it teacher-proof, <laughs> and, and make those experts who really know how to do instructional design and take their work and put it inside the bowels of the machine and have it delivered by the machine to every classroom in America or in the world. And so I, Fred Dignandio you know, is saying you've got to accept people at the core, you've got to accept a little bit of chaos, yeah. mistakes are an occasion for learning, you've got right. to work together. Yeah. The machine is your vehicle, but it's yeah. not in control. No, I, I want the kids and the teacher to think of themselves as pilots in the driver's seat, and they can take this machine where they want to go. And so the, the key thing that we have to decide is, where are you going? Did you, are you the real pilot? Are you, are you just navigating on some pathway that someone else already pre-programmed inside the machine? Could you ever leave this race course and go to an... Could you make up your own race course? Could you make up your own machine? Could you take this machine in le places nobody ever dreamt of? There is that possibility of children being their own pilots and their own authors. The, the raw materials are all around us, and instead of consuming them, children can use them and piece together sounds and images and make their own understanding of the world. And they're capable of doing that, and teachers are capable of doing that. But we have to let them do that. If we bound them into this Nintendo machine and everything's already pre-programmed, 
I think that would be doing a disservice uh, to our young human beings and to our teachers.